This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange with me, Arthur Parkinson, and my good friend and gardening guru, Sarah Raven. And on this episode, I thought we'd do a little recap on the importance and joy of companion planting, which is pairing up usually vegetables, but some flowers, with a plant that aids them in either repelling bad insects or aids them in their growth at times. And for me last year, one of the nicest things I did was post my friend and Sarah's sister-in-law actually, Juliet, who's got a greenhouse. I posted Juliet some seedlings of these tajities as a way of getting her to go into her greenhouse, which fatally she's had built at the very bottom of her garden, which makes it an effort to go there. And these tajities, I was then sent all through the summer photos of them being picked for the vase even before she had a crop of tomatoes so I think flowers in the greenhouse can really help somebody who maybe is new to gardening or isn't that bothered to actually get into the joy of what a greenhouse is and for me who hasn't got a greenhouse I've got this wonderful vision one day of having it just full of tajities and tomatoes Mm. Um, and I know Sarah for a long time now you've championed companion planting for all sorts of reasons haven't you? Yeah well, basically, if you're an organic gardener, which you and I are, you know, chemicals and reaching for anything to kill the bugs that will kill the good bugs as well as the bad bugs mm. is, a, is, a, is a no-no. So I remember very well, honestly, must be 25, 26 years ago, visiting um, a fantastic tomato nursery called Simpson Seeds, uh, which, you know, are still there. And um, I went to do a piece on them for The Telegraph and... I was really struck by how they had tajities at ground level, uh, a really compact one, and then tajities in hanging baskets. And of course, I I sort of said, gosh, that's quite a palava. Why are you doing that? And they said, well, that they found that um, the tajities was brilliant at protecting uh, at ground level, the ground level leaves and flowers from aphids. But at the top, they were still finding they were getting some aphid attack and aphid infestation and so the hanging baskets were to prevent that also full of tajities and we then went on here about 10 years ago to do a trial where we had the little gem no not little gem that's a tomato that's a oh i can't speak this morning that's a lettuce but they're called i think they are called the gem series of tajities yeah and there's an orange gem and a red gem and da And they are really compact. So we did those all the way through, almost like a ground cover under our tomatoes and cucumbers, by the way. And then we also had the one that I know you particularly love and I think was the one you sent Juliet, which is Linnaeus, which is quite a tall. It probably gets to about 60 centimetres or even a bit higher. That then protects the centre of the plant. And then at the top, we did try hanging baskets, but we did find it quite a palaver looking after them. Mm. So actually what we've replaced that with now is a climber. And so it's not a tajities, but we find that any of the acerinas, the tumbergias, cardiospermums, all these tender perennial climbing plants or annual climbers that come from warmer climates and so slightly struggle like cardiospermum, tends to slightly struggle outside, but it has these tiny white flowers, which are fantastic attractants to the right bugs. And so it brings in the bees and the butterflies to feed on the nectar and the pollen. And they then pollinate your tomatoes also at the top of the plant, and they protect against aphid infestation. So we think of it almost like a high rise. So you've got to have your low-rise tajities, and then your mid-rise, and then your high-rise climbers. And that form of companion planting, thinking of it in layers, 
And maybe, you know, you don't need the bottom layer if you're going to have Linnaeus and you keep picking it, which makes it more compact anyway. But that has worked fantastically well for us. So whereas before we used companion planting, we used to get white fly and green fly on the tomatoes and particularly on the cucumbers. Now we genuinely don't. So it really is worthwhile. And just as you say, it looks fabulous too, doesn't it, Arthur? Yeah, and I think I think seasoned veg growers who maybe haven't done this before, they might worry that the companion planting takes up space or yeah. takes nutrients away from something like tomato. But that is that's not true, is it? I mean, you've proven that these things benefit. So how many, if say you had a greenhouse, just a typical one, how many tajetes would you try and grow for your average crop of tomatoes? So if I had nine, so like three rows of three plants, um, which is sort of kind of average size greenhouse, I guess. Yeah. I would think of growing nine tajetes. So, mm. you know, it's it's sort of, it depends on how compact, maybe six if it's Linnaeus because it's such a, a big one. So just between every plant, every row rather of your tomatoes or your cucumbers, you need perhaps a couple. And so, you, you know, you, you don't by no means need a whole packet of seed. And I've said this too many times, but I'm going to say it again in case anyone hasn't heard it. You can store your seed, any seed, but tajetes are really good storers if they're cold, they're dry, and they're dark. And so a Tupperware box in the bottom of the fridge, ideally with a silicon sachet, is where we store our seeds here. And then you just store them from one year to the next. So just take out 10 seeds, sow them, use them for that year, and then you've still got many tens for several years afterwards so storing your seeds right is really worthwhile yeah and what what other systems of companion planting have you tried arthur well well thank thanks to you and, and joseph's efforts with roses i now can't bear the thought of a rose not being with one of the lovely small sage leaf salvias yeah particularly genemsi that that lovely purple one yeah, Nachtlinde. So I've got I've got newly planted beirut roses that I'm looking at right now out the window on this very grey early spring day. And I know for a fact I must get each one, at least one little nine centimetre pot of them, which I'll plant quite close by. Yeah. Because I just want them to have that natural fumigation immediately. It's actually upsetting me seeing their new leaves, knowing there's no salvia there waking up with them. Yeah. But they will get one because yeah. the difference is just, you know, tenfold. Yeah, it really is. It really yeah. is. But the trouble is with a lot of the salvias is that they're not hardy or mm. not 100% hardy. So you have to wait really yeah. until sort of early May to put them out in the garden. But to be honest, the main aphid sort of troubling month is actually May and June. So if you get them out in May, you'll still be safe. And the point is that they, the, the these small-leafed Gregii and Gemensis hybrid salvias have sulfur in their scent profile. So as the water evaporates from the ground going up through the leaf, it turns into a very weak sulfur vapor, which then pours out all over the rows above it and keeps them pristine. And before we had the Clean Air Act, everybody had no black spot and mildew because unfortunately pollution included a lot of sulfur and that's what kept roses really great. Um, so, of course, we want clean air, but we also want lovely clean roses. And you can do it in a completely natural way by marrying them with these salvias. So it, we've we've tried and tested it here long and hard now at Perchill. And it really, really helps. Even we've found here, we've selected varieties that are particularly black spot prone, which sounds ridiculous to do. But I have a favorite called Rhapsody in Blue, which is a color of sort of purple denim. And famously, it gets black spot, but actually planted with an almost matching coloured salvia nachtlinde. It's t it was totally pristine last summer. So I really do absolutely advocate that it's an incredibly effective thing to do. And we use it here also very, very much in the veg garden. And another plant is a fantastically effective companion plant to lots of things, aubergines, chilies, as well as tomatoes and cucumbers, is actually basil, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. And so obviously we all tend to think of basil and tomatoes as nice partners in the kitchen, but they're also very good growing partners. And I think it's they absolutely, a lot of the pollinators love the flowers, so it's good to leave a few to flower. And the pollinators then travel up to the tomato trusses above 
and will then pollinate the flowers as they're hanging and you get a better fruit crop for the basil. And then they also are really good attractants of lacewings and ladybirds, which lay their larvae, and they then munch up the tomato or cucumber plant, eating any tiny aphids or aphid eggs, and so keep them both well-pollinated, but also really, really clean. So basil, sweet genovese, is a lovely plant to eat, but it's also a lovely companion plant. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the the larvae because um, the lovely hoverflies that seem to be coming in more and more various leopard print and tiger print costumes. Yes. They're little babies. They're some of the best aphid eaters, aren't they? They really are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And people forget about them because I think a lot of people still think they're wasps because they're such good impersonators. Yes. But they, they seem to love tagetes like nothing else in the garden. And so are there, are there any other families that you particularly think of as good companion plants? Well, because I'm, I'm not a veg gardener, I don't know that much outside of things looking a beautiful, yeah. but also being beneficial. But what I wondered, um, what my dad always questions in his little veg garden is, how, how do Riverford produce an acre of cabbages organically when they... You know, are they yeah. companion planting in that system or have they got big avenues of it in the field? That's what I always wonder. I know. Well, it'd be nice if we could. We, actually, it's a really good idea. One or other of us should interview one of the mm. Riverford um, veg growers. It would be fantastic to find out about that. You're right. On a big scale. Yeah. I mean, that's maybe we, we might um, finish this, but one of the things that, that we've been using plants for as a natural sort of disease prevention, perhaps uh, you wouldn't quite call this a companion planting, but we have had in a one bed in our greenhouse here, we've had a minor, not major buildup of something called verticillium wilt. And actually a team of gardeners came over here from Sissinghurst last summer. And just the night before I'd gone out and seen an aubergine plant dripping with lovely, delicious, a purple, almost ready and ripe to eat aubergines and the next morning I'd gone out just when the gardeners from Zinsnes were coming and it was dead it had completely wilted overnight and so uh, they arrived and I said gosh do do you have any idea what this is because we seem to have got this a little bit and she said oh yes it's verticillium wilt and that they had tried uh, soil fumigants to clean a bed that they have got in the polytunnel at Sissinghurst. Anyway, so this year we have had the whole winter, we've given up this whole bed to a mustard and we grow a lot of different edible mustards here like red giant mustard, red frills mustard, uh, wasabi mustard. They're all really fantastic, very peppery, well mustardy taste, tasting salad leaves. But actually this time we've just gone for one that is is said to be it's called yellow mustard. It's said to be very good for um, soil fumigant. And we've just allowed it to grow. And just now as it's coming up to flower, we're going to cut it down and rotivate it into that bed. And I know farmers do use that a lot when they get a build up of something like rust, so a fungal disease building up. And so I'm really hoping that um, I'm going to give that bed a break from aubergines this year anyway, but I'm really hoping that that's going to clean up the soil. And so I'm all for experimenting with things like that, that where in the old days you might have reached for a chemical now, you know, don't do an experiment. And and another example of that is another of your favorite Tagetes family, but Minuta, which we did an experiment here against bindweed and ground elder in a rose bed. And this particular Tagetes gives off a toxic exudate at its root tips to some of the perennial weeds. And it sounds like a heavenly plant, doesn't it, <laughs> to clean a bed. And we did find the ground elder was not back considerably. So we were actually able to, with a hand fork, just weed it out. Uh, the bindweed was not back a bit, but not so much. But so that's another plant that whereas I would have reached for glyphosate 20 years ago, now I just won't. I will I will use a plant to help me out. And with, with the mustards, because when we do our veg courses, people always ask at the end, do you rotate your veg garden? But yeah. your mustards are really part of your, is it the autumn you sow them just direct as a, a cover crop? Yeah. Literally like a green manure. I mean, that's mm. really what you're doing. And it it not only 
improves the organic content of your soil, but also because it's really quite a sort of strong, uh, you know, it's got quite strong compounds in it. I think it literally cleanses the soil and um, it really acts as an antifungal, um, but in a completely natural way. Anyway, I'll report back when I know, you know, definitely categorically that it has worked, but I'm not going to try, as I say, aubergines in that bed again for a year, just because I don't want to put the host plant in, which then, you know, the, the um, wilt, which is fungal, could then recolonize. So I'm going to give it at least another year's break. And I'll again do mustards in that, um, but edible varieties this autumn, winter, and then hopefully by next year we can start replanting. Nature's fungicides and natural chemicals, they're everywhere, aren't they, in the plant kingdom? It's just about discovering them. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think it's something that we've lost knowledge of and it would be so good to reclaim it and rediscover it. Mm. And um, yeah, it's oh, gardening for the optimist, I'd say. And all I can report from here is it really definitely seems to work. Thanks so much, Arthur. Lovely to chat. Good, and no need to use any chemicals for this coming growing year. Absolutely not. Thanks so much for listening to Grow Cook Eat a Range with me, Sarah Raven, and Arthur Parkinson. The pair are back together, and I hope it was interesting about companion planting, one of our passions. Next week, I'm joined by another old friend, Simon Lysett, who is one of the most fabulous flamboyant florists in London, doing incredible projects in a lot of the royal palaces and galleries throughout London. Really inspiring. And he is going to be coming to teach here in the autumn. But I just wanted to chat to him about what he's doing now. See you then. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.